that Ghana should tread cautiously when it comes to discharging asymptomatic patients. And that's because, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to go by the WHO standard, especially since they're also asking countries, um, you know, to go ahead with their double negative test before discharge, if that's what better suits them. And so there's a lot to talk about. Send us your messages. What don't you understand? Do you have any questions for Dr. Bertha Sewai? And also Dr. Newman will be joining us today. It's been a while since we had him on. We miss him and we're glad to have him back. We'll talk about the final year senior high school students who are returning to school today. And we'll cross over to some correspondents in the various regions to give us updates on that. My name is Berla Mundi and I have... I am Anita Ikea Akufu. And on the global front, Brazil has crossed that 1 million mark and also... They have recorded over 50,000 deaths in Brazil. And if you remember last week when they crossed the 40,000 mark, there were some, uh, you know, uh, issues regarding a memorial that was created for the 40,000 people that had died. And so now that they have crossed the 50,000 mark and also when the coronavirus outbreak was recorded in Brazil, especially their president felt like, uh, there wasn't anything like coronavirus in the world and so they should live freely and so there's a lot of questions over that part of the world regarding if indeed they have 50,000 deaths and also if the 1 million cases are even what it is and so we'll be giving you all the details in Brazil also in Russia and the United States is still leading uh, globally when it comes to the coronavirus and so you can get in touch with us on our various social media platforms whatever your thoughts are are you in school how is life going on over there and whatever your questions are as well and so my name is Anita Kukufu like I mentioned and so Bella yes absolutely so yes find us on social media TV3 Ghana and also we'll be giving you more details about the president's address yesterday and so let's quickly take a look at Ghana's case count uh, deaths have increased significantly as well. So Anita has all that information for you. Right after that, we'll cross over and speak to Dr. Patrick Abwaje. Yes, and so over the weekend, we saw a huge jump, the first of its kind right here in Ghana since the outbreak of COVID-19 on the 12th of March. And over 5,000 recoveries. A lot of people are wondering if indeed we should go by the figure that has been put out that indeed they have recovered but as of this morning the recoveries slash discharge is 10473 and so initially the discharge is one parameter that was being used by nigeria and i was a little confused when it comes to that if indeed uh, we're talking about people who have recovered fully or people who have just been sent home for home management and so i'm sure uh, during the next uh press briefing by the Ministry of Information and also the Ministry of Health. We will be giving more details on this uh, nuance or variation in this particular parameter. And deaths now stands at 85 with confirmed cases at 14,154. And also when it comes to new cases that have been recorded, we have 147 new cases. And our active cases has uh, reduced due to the number of recoveries or discharges we've had. And so active cases now are 3,000. 596 and out of the 14,154 confirmed cases the greater Accra region has a whooping 8,075 confirmed cases the Ashanti region coming in second with 2,312 the western region with 1,148 central region 794 the eastern region 300 and 73 Volta region 314 Upper East Region 271, Oti Region 105, Western North Region 82, Northern Region 61, Savannah Region 37, Upper West Region 35, Buno East Region 33, and then the Ahafu Northeast Region and Buno Region so far are the only regions recording below 10 cases. And the Ahafu region came uh, into the picture uh, barely a week ago, but now they have some eight cases, eight cases. And so I'm sure after the contact tracing, more cases have been recorded in that particular region and in the northeast region with three, Buno region with three as well. And when we look at the gender distribution, males 57 percent, females at 43 percent. And this is actually the global picture as well because globally more males are also recording um you know more cases and more males are actually being infected by the virus and so now let's look at the 
uh, samples that have been tested and also the positivity rate and for the routine surveillance, 92,707 tests have been conducted with 5,824 being confirmed as positive and the positivity rate is 6.28. And when we go to the contact tracing, initially, they, this parameter uh, was broken down into, uh, you know, different parts but now it's been put together as contact tracing with 177,593 tests being done and out of that number 8,330 have been confirmed as positive with a positivity rate at 4.69 and so in totality the number of tests that have been done as at this morning and also from the last update of the president yesterday is 270,300 total number of tests with 14,154 being confirmed as positive. And now let's look at this new table that has been introduced on the Ghana Health Service website. And this gives us a summary of recoveries or discharges by region from March to June 2020. And so when we go to the Ahafu region, eight cases, none of them has, you know, recovered or been discharged. The Ashanti region with 2,812 cases and out of that, 1869 people have been uh, you know discharged or 1869 have recovered and when we go to the Buno region three cases one discharge or one recovery and also the Buno east region with 33 13 of them have been discharged the central region with 794 660 of them have been discharged the eastern region 373 and out of that 215 have been discharged the great Accra region which has the highest number that is 8075 cases out of that 6181 people so far from march have been discharged or we can confirm them as recovered and the northern region with 61 cases 32 of them have been discharged as well the northeast region with three and out of the three two people have been discharged ot region 105 31 recovered savannah 37 and the, the whole 37 of them uh, have been discharged as well upper east region with 271 and 23 of the 271 cases have been uh, discharged or confirmed as recovered and for the upper west region we have 35 with 32 recoveries volta 314 with 251 recoveries and the western region with 1,148 cases from uh, March till date. And then out of that, 1,069 of them have been discharged as well. And then the Western region, 1,000. Okay, now let's go to the Western North region where 82 people have been confirmed as positive with 57 of them being discharged. And so when we add all the uh, various recoveries or discharges that have been done from March to June, we have 10,473 out of the 14,154 cases that have been recorded. And that gives us a recovery rate of 74.0. And that is according to the Ghana Health Service website. And this is a new table that has been included, you know, uh, as part of the other tables that we've had so far. And so this is it. And so for Okay, this one has to do with the general surveillance and then enhanced contact tracing where it gives you the number of cases uh, recorded in each of the various parameters as well. And so, Bella, this is what uh, data is looking like so far. Lots hmm. of recoveries. Yeah. Lots of recoveries and discharges. Exactly. So how do we separate the two? Are we saying that discovery, uh, discharges and recoveries are the same now? It's a little confusing. We, we can't say they are the same. Well, it could be that someone is still positive but has been discharged to go home for home management. Absolutely. Because our facilities are being overwhelmed. So. But, but on the website, we have that together. We have that together. And number. so we're unable to exactly. tell what the difference is. Exactly my point. And so thank you so much, Anita, by the way. And we've been joined by Eugene Sebastian Arthur. He's a virologist. And I remember there was a time when he made some comments about the recoveries in Ghana and how he thought that a different kind of approach could help us record some more, uh, you know, uh, recoveries, pardon me. And so he's joining us via Skype. Good morning, Eugene. Eugene, I, you might have to work on your sound. I don't think I can hear you. Kindly just check if... Good morning. Can Good morning. Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, do you feel vindicated by your earlier statement about how Ghana could record some more recoveries 
if we had used a particular, particular kind of approach. And if you can just uh, remind us what exactly you had said in the past and whether it coincides with what's happening currently. Yeah, sure. Um, good morning, um, Bella and Anita, and also your viewers. So basically, I had always made a, a claim that our recoveries are very slow, and it is because um, we were doing the two negative tests with the PCR. Mm. Now, I stated that the PCR basically looks at the genome, the viral genome, which can be there for as long as God knows when. Mm. Uh, for this particular virus, we don't really know. But the, the, the presence of the genome, which is the positive test that we always hear, does not really um, correlate with infectious virus. Infectious virus should be the whole virus, you understand? So we have the capsid, we have the genome, and we have the spikes and everything intact. That is what we call an infectious virus, okay? Mm. Now, when you test positive, I made, I made mention that when you test positive, it does not mean you have the disease. It okay. means you have the presence of the virus in, um, in terms of its genome. Now, when people recover, you can still have some of the RNA, which is the genome, lingering, which can be picked by the PCR test that has been done. Mm -hmm. But for the person infectious, you have to do another test, which is called the virus culture. In this case, you take the sample from the individual, okay? So you can take the droplets we talked about. So you can just take nasal swabs, mm. or you can take from the throat. Now, when you put the samples from this on a cell, okay, and the cell dies, it means that they've been infected. I'm using very basic terms. Okay. It means that the cell are dead and the virus is infectious. But the research that was done in Singapore and elsewhere shows that when they took samples from individuals who have tested positive after some time, they couldn't get these viruses infecting the cells. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is the cell culture. So these people tested positive. That's the virus culture. Okay. Now, that is what I've always been mentioning, that if we could do that experiment in Ghana, if we could do that experiment in Ghana, our recovery rate at the time wouldn't be that low. It would be high as we are seeing now. So, yes, it makes sense that we are seeing the numbers we are seeing because we have, uh, WHO have accepted that experiment, which I have said several times that people have actually bashed me on. Mm -hmm. But today I, I feel treated like you said. You know, I'm a scientist. I'm not. I'm not going to jubilate about this. Yeah. Because it's something we're doing. That okay. I'm. I'm really happy that people can be discharged. They will go home and do their daily activities. Because trust okay. me, they don't have the disease. They only had the virus. Which, uh, trust me, most of us will even have it, and we don't know. Okay. Now, if that's the case, I know that the WHO put out these protocols after some research was done. Here in Ghana, since we've adopted this new strategy as well. Is it backed by any research that we conducted here in Ghana to ascertain whether this really uh, can work for us? Yeah, um, I, I don't have any evidence as to whether Ghana has done any experiments on that. But um, trust me, science is very universal, okay? Mm. So if I'm doing something out there, it is very possible that you'll get the same data uh, uh, replicated in Ghana. However, again, I have also said that it's very interesting if Ghanaian researchers can do something to back the data okay. that WHO has. But it, I don't have any evidence that it has been done. Yeah, but because me, if, uh, if that's not the case, yeah. if that's the case, then it means that we may be copying blindly because I believe that um, the communicator that WHO put out as well indicated that some countries could still go ahead with their double negative test just to be sure. That's if they are not too clear on whether to go ahead and discharge um, you know, asymptomatic patients after 10 days or so. And I remember the president also mentioned at a point that we'll have to come up with tailor-made, um, you know, um, ways of managing the situation. So that's why I'm asking that should we not have waited? Are we not rushing too quickly uh, to discharge people without any research being conducted here in Ghana? Can you hear me, Sebastian? Yeah, so um, yeah. Anita, that's a good question. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. it's a good question. I think the, the, the key thing here is that science is very universal. If people want to go ahead with their double negatives and then discharge people, that is fine. It is up to them. But going with what WHO is saying, it's also good. Now, what I'm saying is that science is very universal. Mm -hmm. And again, I would press upon our researchers to do some short experiments. Okay. We have patients out there getting daily cases. So if we have the facility, remember, this experiment is not so easy to do. And the facility you need is a, a, a bit sophisticated. But if we have everything in place and we can do it, it will be very good to do our own experiment to see what happens. But with the clinicians, I'm sure um, the Ghana Health Service won't copy blindly like we are thinking. Okay. Maybe they might have monitored the disease condition, the progression 
of people who have been um, in isolation centers. Now note, most of our patients are actually asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Most, most. Mm -hmm. Last time I heard it was more than 60%. Okay. okay. So I've always said that if you are asymptomatic, after two weeks, you should be discharged because you will not have, uh, you will not be shedding infectious viruses after two weeks. The first few days of getting infected is when you start shedding the virus and you can infect a lot of people. Okay. okay. In actual fact, research is showing that asymptomatic um, um, individuals, uh, asymptomatic individuals shed the virus more than asymptomatic individuals. Okay. But the reason why it's important to do mass testing is to pick those people who might be asymptomatic but will develop symptoms as time goes on. And, so that's, yes, the and that's the thing, places. because sorry to cut you, are we really sure. sure that asymptomatic patients at a point never really show the virus? Because you're saying that some of them may show um, symptoms. Do all of them show symptoms at a point or is it just some people? Because if so I'm remember, coughing or maybe I have a cold or something okay. and I'm asymptomatic, at that point, am I not showing symptoms and could I not be highly infectious at that point? So if you are coughing or you are showing any form of symptom, you are not asymptomatic. Okay. Now, this is... Okay, well, that's uh, Sebastian Arthur. He's a virologist. We're trying to get a fair understanding of, you know, this whole issue about discharge protocols. He's back, and so let's go back to him. Yes, you are saying, Sebastian. Yeah, I'm saying that the, uh, being asymptomatic shouldn't be more than 14 days. Now, if you are... Uh, from the first day you tested positive to the 14th day, if you are not showing symptoms, then you, you are not going to show symptoms. That is what um, the, the studies and the profile is showing now. Oh, I see. So that is why we said within 10 days and 14 days, if you remember the protocol very well, yes. within 10 and 14 days, uh -huh. the individual can be destroyed. So from the first day you started showing symptoms till the 14th, uh, till the 14th day, 10 days and 14 days, the person should be allowed to go. If their symptoms have left, Okay. You understand? Okay. Uh, these people cannot share the virus. Well, moving on, before I let you go, what can we do differently in order to further manage the situation here in, in the country? Um, I think we have to still keep doing our testing. You know, this time around, I think the pressure on our testing will be reduced because we are not doing the two negative tests. So we'll still have test kits and um, the manpower to do some more testing, please. We shouldn't stop testing. We should, you know, Donald Trump recently said. I think he came out to say jokingly that he was he was not really serious with it. Mm. But he said that if you stop testing, you won't get more cases. You know, but the problem is if you stop testing, you won't get more cases. But the reality is that there'll be more cases. Okay. Okay. So let's keep testing and then let's monitor the people effectively. However, the protocols must not be stopped. The right. um hand and with soap and uh, running water, and then the um, mask and social distancing should not be ignored, and I think we'll be fine with time. All right. Thank you so much. Eugene Sebastian Arthur is a virologist, and he says he feels vindicated after earlier um, insisting that we could record a higher number of recoveries if only we adopted a different kind of approach. It's time for news updates. We'll be back with more. Welcome to News Update on COVID-19 360. The coronavirus crisis should lead to more integrity and less hypocrisy in politics and society, Pope Francis has said. In an excerpt from a recent interview with his biographer, the head of Catholic Church said, This crisis is affecting us all, rich and poor alike, and putting a spotlight on hypocrisy. I am worried by the hypocrisy of certain political personalities who speak of facing up to the crisis, of the problem of hunger in the world, but who in the meantime manufacture weapons. This is a time to be converted from this kind of function of hypocrisy. It's time for integrity. Either we are coherent with our beliefs or we lose everything. Prime Minister Boris Johnson will discuss England's approach to changes with the COVID-19 Strategy Committee on Monday. On Tuesday, he is to announce if the hospitality sector can reopen on July 4 and if the two-meter distancing rule in can be relaxed. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will decide on these issues separately. Lower income households are using savings and borrowing more during the lockdown, while richer families are saving more as eating out and trips abroad are banned, according to a research by Resolution Foundation. The Children's Foundation has warned children are developing serious mental health conditions, including post-traumatic stress because of the pandemic. Face coverings are now compulsory on public transport in Scotland. 
non-essential shops are reopening in Wales for the first time since coronavirus restrictions began. New Zealand on Monday said it is extending its ban on cruise ships arriving in the country. We are extending the current cruise ship ban, which is due to expire on, 30, on June 30, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern told a press conference. New Zealand has been one of the world's most successful countries in fighting the coronavirus. It has lifted all internal restrictions, but measures at the border remain. In the early stages of the pandemic, cruise ships have often been hotbed for the virus spreading and several of them have spent weeks at sea or quarantined in a harbour before passengers are allowed to disembark. In France, going to school is now compulsory for Monday for everyone up to the age of 15. Only lycees or high schools which cover the last three years of school education are not affected. Schools have been open for several weeks but only on voluntary basis. Brazil has become the second country after the U.S. to register more than 50,000 deaths from COVID-19. It comes amid growing political tension and just days after the country confirmed more than 1 million coronavirus infections. Graphs of Brazil's death and infections show a continuing climb. The World Health Organization has also recorded the biggest one-day increase in cases globally with most of the new infections in the Americas. Two health ministers, both doctors, have resigned as deaths and infections have surged. And that's all we have for you on news updates on COVID-19 360. All right, and that was news updates. Time now to take a look at Africa's case counts with Anita. And so this is how the continent is looking. We've crossed the 300,000 mark. That is 306,739 confirmed cases with 5,900. And 89 healthcare workers being affected with death standing at 8,118 and recoveries at 146,451. And South Africa is a little over 2,000. Uh, cases away from that 100,000 mark. And as of this morning, they have 97,302. And so by the end of the week, I can say that South Africa, looking at the rate at which they are testing more people, would have gone past that 100,000 mark. And they will be the first on the African continent to record the highest number of cases, especially crossing the 100,000 mark. And when we go to Egypt, they also crossed the 50,000 mark as at last week. And they have 55,233 cases now. And there's a lot of concerns, especially in the prisons of Egypt, with the way uh, certain prisoners are being handled, especially when they are confirmed as positive. And their family members are not even allowed to send them, um, how do you call it, hand sanitizers and certain protective gears to be used. And these are some of the concerns uh, families of inmates have raised regarding how their people are being treated in there. And when we come to Nigeria, over 20,000 cases in the most populous nation in Africa. And in Nigeria, 20,244 people have been confirmed as having the coronavirus. And there are people who even think that, looking at the population in Nigeria, this figure that we even think is a whole lot isn't enough because they are not doing enough testing. And uh, last week also, some doctors in Nigeria have been complaining about the inadequate, you know, uh, protective equipment that are available for them to use. And so that has also contributed to the number of tests that are being done and it being inadequate. And when we come down here to Ghana, yes, over 14,000 cases have been recorded. And this morning, we are looking at um, over 14,000 cases right here in Ghana. Let's go to Cameroon with 11,892 and then Algeria with 11,771. Let's look at the recoveries now, which is more assuring, especially on the African continent, since we have over 100,000 recoveries. And this morning, we're looking at 146,451, with South Africa contributing 51,600 and eight recoveries, Egypt with 14,736 recoveries, Ghana uh, over 10,000 recoveries now at 10,473, and then Algeria with 8,422 recoveries, and when we go to Morocco, 8,319 recoveries have been recorded. Now let's look at the deaths and how the continent 
is doing when it comes to that particular parameter. And Egypt is leading with 2,193. So out of the 8,118 deaths, Egypt has 2,193, with South Africa coming in closely with 1,930, and then Algeria with 845. And so the first two countries that have the highest debt, you can see there's a vast difference between those two and the third country, which is Algeria. And then Sudan is 521, with Nigeria 518. When it comes to this particular parameter, Ghana is down there somewhere with 85 deaths. And so that is quite good as the chart goes down. You realize that the deaths keep decreasing and that is good for the continent as uh, when you're comparing it to the global picture on the African continent the debts are quite low which is really good now for healthcare workers who have been affected South Africa is leading with 2084 healthcare workers with 14 debts Nigeria second with 812 and this figure when it comes to uh, Nigeria has been like that from last week it, it was 812 and still 812 which is good uh, with two deaths. Egypt with 350, still 19 healthcare workers have died. Cameroon with 325 healthcare workers who have been affected with three deaths. And then Ghana with 227, no healthcare worker has died as at this update. And so let's go to the Johns Hopkins uh, dashboard and see how the global picture is looking like. And we're just a few cases away from the 9 million mark. As of last week, the projection was at 10 million this morning. It is still at 10 million and the total confirmed cases stands at 8,969,827. Hmm. And so the United States is leading with 2,280,969. And like uh, Dr. Sebastian mentioned, the United States, Trump during one of his uh, campaigns in Oklahoma mentioned that uh, they should slow down on the testing because he's getting overwhelmed with the number of tests that are being done because over 25 million tests and then 2 million or 2.2 million have been confirmed as positive. And so the more tests that are being done, the probability of getting more confirmed uh, positive cases is really high. And so he thinks they should slow down. And that I'm not sure a lot of people will take it lightly because the more we test, the more we are able to isolate the people who are positive and then we know how to treat them and then they will come out as recovered. And so for that statement, well, he he later came out to say that it was just on the lighter note, but still, I'm sure they will roast him. Now, let's go to Brazil, and they have crossed the 1 million mark with 1,083,341 cases in Brazil. And I, I'm still thinking if uh, still uh, President of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, still stands by what he said that the virus doesn't even exist. I mean, the United States and Brazil have something in common when it comes to their leaders, especially around this time. These two countries have had uh, leaders who do not want to accept that there's anything like the coronavirus. And Trump especially calls it uh, the Chinese flu, or now he says it's the Kung flu. So I'm still wondering if after the number of cases that are being recorded in these two countries, and uh, they, they will still stand by what they keep saying. Now let's go to Russia, where they crossed the 500,000 mark last week. And this morning, we're looking at 591,000. 464 confirmed cases in Russia. And then when we go to India as well, we have 425,282. And globally, like I mentioned when I was giving you the figures right here in Ghana, I mentioned that uh, on the global scale, a lot of men or the males are recording more cases as compared to the females. But it's uh, the other way around in India as more females are being affected and the probability of them passing on in India, according to uh, experts in India, is very high. And so um, when we go to the United Kingdom, which is the fifth now, the United Kingdom, according to Boris Johnson, they are looking to opening up when it comes to the hospitality sector, which has been under some sort of uh, halt for the past couple of months. But they want to open hotels and also they want to uh, put in that one meter plus rule and see if indeed they can uh, make some headway with it because of course we cannot continue having uh, the hospitality sector under uh, lockdown for so long and so they want to ease the restrictions on uh, that particular sector now let's look at the recoveries 
and now we have 4,443,409 recoveries globally and the United States with 622,133 recoveries. Brazil second with 533,118 recoveries. Russia with 500 and, uh, 343,000, I beg your pardon, 847 recoveries. And then India also with 237,196. And for the deaths, we have 468,000 deaths. Uh, 567,000. And so we're taking a break at this point. When we come back, there's more as the global projection globally is now at 10 million. And so this is COVID-19 360. We take a break. When we come back, there's more. Do stay. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We'll take some messages after which we'll speak to Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi and Dr. Newman Arthur. Anita. All right. So this one says, till when will we be independent following someone's research to manage our affairs? Why don't we make our own research to come out with firm decisions on our discharge issue, but rather listening to some portion of World Health Organization's findings? I fear what is going to happen in some weeks to come. May God have mercy on this mismanagement of this disease. Our lives are in our hands now. Okay. Okay, let me come to this one. Okay, this is quite long. It says, hello, Mama Bella and sweet sister Anita. You ladies are looking great. Thank you. Please, I have a concern. I took a Metro Mass bus on Tuesday from a doom to my area. One, people were just pushing and rushing to get it. Two, the bus wasn't full initially, and I thought the bus driver was just being cautious uh, because of the social distancing. But I was shocked when she kept on taking more passengers at every stop people were complaining but this woman will not listen the only thing she did was make sure everyone was in a face mask but aside that the bus was full like we usually see it the mistake i also made was to still sit in this crowded bus with no breathing space okay hmm. that is a big issue but good morning i have runny nose for the past 10 days and they ran a test on me and gave me medicine. The medicine is finished, but I still have running news. Okay, I guess uh, maybe Dr. Bertha Sewayi will, will talk about that. Uh, this one says, blessed uprising COVID-360 family. Okay, please. My question is about mad men, or you're talking about mentally challenged men and women running through town all the time. Please, I want to know whether uh, a mentally challenged person can contract the disease. And if yes, how on earth do we get to know and even come to think of isolation? Isolation. Hmm. That isn't an issue we've even thought of. Wow. Okay. Uh, this one from Williams Yaka in Yendi says, some Ghanaians are still not believing that COVID-19 exists. I don't know if they want to feel and touch it before they believe. Then it is left to them. To some of us, the virus is real. And so we continue to ask for God's protection and guidance. We should stop politicizing the issue. Okay. This one says, I'm Fadil from Ashoman Estate. We should be very careful because this uh number of cases of the virus will be more than we expect okay so uh later on in the show we'll be reading more of your messages and so our whatsapp number is active send all your concerns everything that has been happening around you and let us know and so right now bella is standing by with dr betha sewayi and then dr newman absolutely and so good morning it's good to have you all join us this morning i hope you all will yes good morning, morning. Uh -huh. And good right. morning to your audience. Good morning. Nice Dr. morning. Newman. Yeah. Dr. Newman, it's good to have you. It's been about two weeks since the last time we had you on COVID-19. I hope you're well. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Yesterday, you mentioned that you were in isolation. Okay. Uh, uh, I, yes, I'm, I'm waiting for my labs to, to, to find out uh, what, what exactly the situation is. So that's it. Okay, what happened, if we may ask? You came across a COVID-19 patient? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we wish you the very best, and we hope that you have not contracted the virus. Okay, no problem. Uh, Dr. Beth, I hope you had a great weekend. Let's start off with you. Now, there's been a lot of confusion over the weekend as to what it really means to discharge people um, almost immediately after 10 days or 14 days because... They are not showing any signs or symptoms and the fact that they could be less likely to be infectious. So take us back to that explanation of what an asymptomatic patient really means and what a symptomatic patient really means. And at what point do they stop shedding the virus? All right, Bella, thank you for the question. So um, 
We know by this time that about 80% of patients who are infected with COVID-19, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, would have mild to moderate symptoms, and 20% will end up in the hospital severely ill. What we also do know is that even of this 80%, study after study after study has shown us that about 47% of individuals actually have zero symptoms. It means that if you had not gone to test them, they wouldn't even have known that they have any disease or anything wrong with them. And so on January 12th, during the initial part of the outbreak, the WHO released a guideline that said that these patients who have no symptoms, they should at least, everybody should test them twice with two throat PCR tests 24 hours apart. That was the evidence, mm. and that was what needed to be done. And Ghana took the high road and did exactly that. And I must admit, there were several countries which did not do that. And then sometime last month, Singapore said they had tracked a few of their patients, I believe it was 14 or so, who had tested positive the second time round, and they decided to do a viral culture to see if these were viable viruses. And they realized that it was fragments of the virus. And they tracked 700 of their contacts. Two of these contacts tested positive. And it was unclear if they picked it up from the patients who had tested positive the second time, or they had picked it up from somebody because they also had evidence of contact with another person. And then Germany also did a study, just nine patients, though I have to remind you, they only tracked nine patients who had tested positive the second time and did a viral culture, meaning they were testing if the virus was still alive. And they were able to prove that those nine patients, the virus was dead. So fast forward to Ghana. It looks like Ghana also has unpublished data that said they've also tracked 146 patients and they found that by day 14 the virus had cleared from their throats or the viral culture was negative now on may 27th the who based on the german data okay german mm -hmm. data of nine patients also gave the following caveats number one they noticed that Countries are overwhelmed with isolation centers being full. Number two, lack of testing, even for those who are acutely ill, was not adequate. So imposing that second PCR test on countries with um, minimal resources was a sort of a difficulty or placing a strain on the healthcare systems. And number three, people got extremely anxious just waiting for the second test results. Now, mm. somehow, these are the three factors also prevailing in Ghana, where we have a large backlog, isolation centers are getting full, and people get extremely anxious and sometimes even run away from these um, isolation centers. So therefore, based on that data, the WHO made this recommendation. Now, before I want to, I even mentioned the recommendation, I want to state something clearly they said, which should not be misinterpreted. They said, one, there is no zero risk based strategy. It means you can't say that this recommendation is foolproof. Mm. They are not, and you can read it yourself. They said there is no zero risk based strategy. Secondly, countries can continue to do the two test testing if they do their own risk assessments. In other words, WHO is saying, okay, don't swallow what we've given to you whole just like that. Mm. Do your own risk assessment and determine what you want to do. But the WHO guideline that came out on May 27th, and they issued a brief on it on June, June um, this past Thursday or Wednesday, June 17th, said, based on the German study, they are recommending if you, are, if you have symptoms, 10 days without, I mean, 10 days of being tested positive and three days without symptoms. So that, let's say for 20 days you have symptoms, we have to wait for three more days after your symptoms are gone before you get discharged. Okay. And then for those symptomatic, 10 days after your test, you could be discharged. Okay, so fast forward, Ghana also studied 146 patients 
And they concluded that they found that at least by day 14, the symptoms, I mean, most people had cleared the virus. So instead of the 10 days released by WHO, mm -hmm. Ghana's guide says 14 days without symptoms, I mean, 14 days of, after having tested positive, you can be discharged if you didn't have any symptoms. And if you have symptoms, at least you 14 days after your symptoms started, and three days after not having any symptoms. So that could range from even day 40, if somebody is still acutely ill, so it's just guideline at this. So in a way, we're not copying blindly, mm. but I want to is the fact that there is no zero risk-based strategy. Like you can't say that, you know what? This guideline is perfect and no one will get infected because even the WHO guideline continues to state that there is great variability in a lot of people. We do know that some people will keep shedding virus up 40 days, even after the 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 their symptoms have resolved. Some even so that is why they're saying you can't it's not like days you should go home okay. and you are never hold on Dr. Bertha, Dr. Newman. I think we're getting some feedback again. So if you can kindly mute your sound for us please. Thank you. Dr. Bertha, please carry on. Yeah so I'm just saying that we have we've done in a way Ghana has done what WHO recommended which is a risk assessment of okay. our own situation. Number one, at least unpublished data, which we are yet to see, says that by day 14, most people have cleared their virus based on the 146 patients. Okay. Secondly, our treatment centers are overwhelmed. Um, we don't have enough testing capacity. People get extremely anxious. And so it's sort of like making a policy. A policy is never perfect. It would have its pitfalls and good sides, but you need to do something so that things can move on. And I realized that over the weekend, so many people were declared, quote unquote, recovered and probably be leaving the treatment center. Yeah. So that is um, a good, I think, a fair balance of how to evaluate the guideline. Okay. If that's the case, could it be that maybe um, after a while the virus doesn't shed and so I'm, I'm discharged, allowed to go home? And then I could fall sick again because maybe my immune system is compromised. Is it possible for that to happen? And if that's the case, can I then start passing on the virus at that point? Um, yeah, no, because um, remember, those who would really get severe symptoms and fall ill again, and even it's not ill again, like the disease will take a worse turn or what we call the cytokine storm. That typically happens between day 8 to 10. I haven't heard of a cytokine storm happening after that except in the children who usually present after day 30 with that severe um, toxic shock like syndrome so i think that our guideline of using 14 days is a fair guideline okay Most people are not likely to come back the only thing you have to remember bella is that there's a there's a fine line between different viruses you take a virus like hiv for as long as the person is alive they have a high likelihood of transmitting the virus if they are not taking their treatment. Mm. Then you compare something like hepatitis B, the person will still have a high chance of transmitting throughout their lifetime through sexual intercourse or through injection drug use. However, their transmission through urine, saliva, stool, and even touching them is only highest when they are acutely ill. Meaning, if somebody has acute hepatitis B, their urine is infectious and it coincides with their symptoms. However, after that, you can touch their urine, sit with them, and you won't get it. So it is also, if you look at the WHO guideline, that's one of the things they mentioned, that okay. they are hoping that your period of transmissibility coincides with your period of being highly symptomatic. Okay. Dr. Newman, I'm bringing you in, and please remember to turn on your sound. So does this not send a wrong signal, maybe, to citizens, especially because now all of a sudden we're realizing that about 10,000 people have recovered, maybe, and have been discharged. And so that means that everything seems okay, even though we're being told that, you know, we're still not in normal times. Um, I, I think... Dr. Newman. Yeah, so okay. I, you know, the, 
at the beginning, I think at the beginning of, of this whole pandemic, we we're all running around and people were quite afraid because it was new. And it's like people really didn't understand what it was and, and what they could do. So it spread some, uh, I wouldn't say unnecessary, but some unmeasured, uh, inappropriate kind of, of panic. And everybody was trying to do something to be able to uh, keep the spread of the virus. And even the management of, of the virus was quite difficult because of the because we didn't really understand a lot about about the, the the illness. But now with the current information going on, I think we have to keep modifying our approach and our education based on current findings. Mm. And so so that our our measures will be measured, you know, appropriate and not overly panic and all that. Because now we know <laughs> that um, it is not as dangerous as it used to be. For some people, it, uh, the impact is very, very severe on them. Others, no. So in the, with the current information, what, what then next is the, is the, uh, should be the approach. Yeah. I think we should, we should keep educating people and not, and not uh, say that it is not there and not do what we are supposed to do. Even now, we expect the numbers to go up. Right, with all the things we are seeing in the county, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, students going back to school, uh, with all the MPP issues with primaries and all that, with the opening of churches, and we expect the numbers to, <laughs> to go up. But the question is that what will be the final impact on the people if they get the, the, the virus? So all the current measures, you know, has to do with, okay, it was spread. When it's spread, what is the impact yeah. on the population? It's closing down everything, while the virus is spreading and when it spreads, what is the next step to take and, and things like that, you know. So we shouldn't lose guard. We should all be very, very careful because for some people, it's going to be very, very severe uh, uh, on them and, and, and keep educating the people. Speaking of how severe it would be on these people, now starting today, final year senior high school students will be going along with the gold track, second, um, well, gold track, um, you know, students as well. And so the question would be that, could this not impact on their psychology in such a way that it will, you know, cause some fear and panic? And so instead of them focusing on their education, they probably will be more focused on trying not to catch the virus, staying safe. Does this not affect them in any way? It will. It will. Uh, depending on the kind of information they get, it will. Because um, the, the anxieties will be there, even the stress in trying to uh, uh, apply all the protocols in school. You know, even exams itself comes with its, its own anxieties. So adding this would raise the anxieties a bit. But with time, depending on what happened, happens, it's going to increase or not. For example, if someone in a certain school gets the virus, it, it's really going to impact on the students, right? And they realize that many more people are getting it. It's really going to, you know, influence them. That is, that is my concern now. Because now we can say, okay, they should go to school. But if, if we start recording cases in the school, <laughs> it's going to cause unnecessary fear and panic among the students. Mm. And some of them may not even be able to. Imagine you go to school and now you can't, you know, shake, you know, other students. Everybody's always in face mask. They sleep in, you know, uh, social distancing on, on, their, in, on their, their dormitories. They go to class and everybody is further apart. All those things are going to create a certain kind of anxiety and some stress for the student. So I expect that even with the academic performance, it may affect it a bit, you know, but with time, depending on how things go in the various schools, it's going to get worse or not. Hmm, Dr. Bertha, what are the yeah. risks involved, especially because we have not tested these students who are going back to school? Um, you know, what could be the risk involved in this? Um, there is, the risk is real, the risk of transmission, because... Um, given that um, we, we know that about 47% of these COVID-19 patients do not have symptoms, it means people would be going to school who are carrying the virus and they don't know they have it and they have not been tested. And despite the WHO recommendations, Bella, I have to tell you that people have studied the ships, nursing homes, people in long-term care facilities, homeless people, and they've concluded that asymptomatic transmission is real and is possible because mm. just a few people got on one ship and infected 3,500 people. A lot of the people who infected other people did not have symptoms. And so we know that 
asymptomatic transmission, much as some people would like us to believe it doesn't exist, it exists. And so there is some risk. I, I cannot put a number to that risk, but we should expect, you know, one or two. That is why if there was no risk, we, they wouldn't be asked to wear masks. And there would not be that requirement that all the boarding schools have to set up one house a site yeah. for isolation. In other words, we know there's risk, but we, we life has to go on sort of thing. Okay. So, should we take advantage of the situation then and start testing these students whilst they are in school? Maybe that's a way of curbing the spread, even whilst they adhere to the safety protocols? I mean, I think that would be a smart idea. And we've mentioned it on this program before, um, how that policy would be effective. I, it might be a really good thing because now, instead of people having to go to a place to get tested, the children are already in school. And it's a matter of testing them. And I'm almost thinking that the various PTA associations of the different schools need to sit up, think about this, and maybe get some free all these. Okay. Hoping that the government um, undertakes mass testing. Okay. Dr. Newman, now there are some staff yes. of these various schools who live in the schools with their family in the you know teachers bungalows and all of that and so this as well could affect them because if someone tests positive passes it on to a teacher or school authority and that person goes back home it's very likely they're passing it on to their family members as well in your case how do we psych up you know um the, the staff to also know how to protect their family members even though they don't have a choice and to be around the students Dr. Newman, can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Newman. Well, Dr. Beth, I'll come to you since we, we seem to have lost Dr. Newman. Do you want to say anything about this in particular? Oh, about the fact that the parents, um, should, the, the teachers have been... Well, they, they will encounter the students. And so if their family members also live on campus, then that also poses a, a major risk. Yeah, Bella, the, the situation you are describing is what doctors have faced every day since the outbreak. You go and take care of COVID patients and you come back to your family and you know they're at risk, but it's sort of like it is what it is. So, yes, there is some risk to... Um, the only good thing about the teachers is that they don't know if the, the, the students have um, disease or not. But unlike the physicians, you sort of go in mean that this person has coronavirus and yeah. I could fall ill, but it's my line of work. So that's something that, so I think the teachers are going to need some good education. Exactly. Before the, yes, to know what to do and what not to do. Absolutely. Dr. Newman, welcome back. Uh, I know we're having some challenges yeah. with your internet, but you want to touch on this? Yes. So I, I, you know, I keep saying that so far as people gather, it will be difficult to control their behavior. So the way to stop the spread is to stop people from gathering. And, and, and that is it. Even in these schools, you know, we, we've put all kinds of measures, but so far as people gather, it will be difficult to control their behavior. So um, we should expect, you know, higher numbers, you know, recordings in the, in the coming weeks. And depending on what happens in a school, the fear and panic is, is going to uh, be higher or not. So if a teacher goes to school and gets it and spreads to the family, it's going to spread because those teachers also have, have, have kids and those kids may mingle with other people and it's going to spread, you know. And, and for a school, they come from all kinds of places and congregate at a particular point. So you have people coming from all kinds of places coming together. And that is, that is what makes it quite serious. It, it's not like probably in a small area People are coming from a small area. But people are from there. For example, if it's in Fantipe, people are coming from the northern part, Ashanti, Takrade, coming from all kinds of places, from these centers to that place. So now the schools can become epicenters for the spread of the virus. Mm. <laughs> the school can be become the central point where, where it is spread to the community. You know, so uh, <laughs> let, let's pray that, you know, we will not, things won't get out of hand in the, in the various schools. Because I, yeah. if it's spread in one of the schools, it's going to create some, some kind of fear. How do we manage a situation where parents will not be allowed to see their, um, you know, wards as well because they would be in school and we're trying to reduce the possible spread of the virus? We're not even sure. 
if these students will be given access to mobile phones whilst they are in school as well. And so what, what do you have to say about this? Yeah, I think that the, student, the teachers would have to come up with creative ways of bridging the gap so that uh, students who really need to see their parents, some arrangements can be made, you know, for them to see the parents, maybe on phone or Skype or something. I think they have to be creative about it. And I'm not sure they are going to be in school for a long time. I think it's for about a month or so, right, to finish their exams and go back home. So that period may be a bit uncomfortable, but I think the schools, each school would have to determine how uh, effective that thing would be in terms of allowing parents to see a, a student. But you know, when parents come to school, you know, it, it's nice. You know, when they come and visit you and you can share problems with them and they can encourage you about your exams and all that, it helps. So students would have to lose that in addition to all the stresses, you know, with the season. And so it's going to be very challenging for them. And I'm, I'm just praying, hoping that it won't affect their final exams. You know, this season and their final exams is really going to be a test, you know, of, okay. of resilience for the students. It's never going to be easy. But so far as people gather, controlling their behaviors will be difficult. That is why for the MPP primaries, it was very difficult to control anything. You know, they shouldn't have gathered. If you gather, you, you will struggle to control, mm. you know, the, people's behaviors. Okay. Difficult. Very, very difficult, yes. Absolutely. And so uh, this is where we end today's conversation. Dr. Betha Sewai, thank you so much. Dr. Newman Arthur, uh, we're hoping that the results will turn out negative so you can get back to work. And so all the best. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll speak to you both tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank so Dr. Yeah. Betha Sewai is an infectious disease specialist. And we also have Dr. Newman Arthur, who is a clinical psychologist. Welcome back. It's still TV3, well, well COVID-19, 360. And right behind me, we've been joined by our correspondents from two regions. Uh, Thomas Khan is joining us from the central region and Ibrahim Abubakar from the Ashanti region. Now, we're having a conversation about the final year senior high school uh, students who are to return to school today to complete a six weeks, um, you know, revision uh, week. And then after that, they will write their exams. And so they're going to be giving us updates on what exactly is happening. And so good morning. To all of you, uh, eventually we'll be joined by Yvonne Nikwe from the Eastern region as well. But Thomas, can you tell us exactly where you are today and what is happening so far? Yeah. So, as I speak to you now, I'm currently at the Washington School and you can see uh, from the background. Uh, Thomas. Uh, subject to some kind of strict check. Hello. Okay, you'll have to yeah, start again. And please, if you can project, because... We can barely hear you because of your nose mask. Okay, so what I'm saying is that I'm currently at the fasting school. Okay. Like you can see from the background. Mm. Yes, and then uh, what I see, I'm currently at the entrance. And uh, you can see uh, sort of like a traffic here. Yeah. It's because any person... Okay, Th Th Thomas, you might... Before you enter the school. For instance, you get to the main and Hi. Okay, your line is yes, breaking. Hello. Your line is breaking, and so it's making it very difficult for us to hear everything you're saying. If you can come again. So you're saying that the, there's some traffic at the entrance because, what, students are trooping in? Yes, at the entrance of the... And uh, you can see from the background that every... Uh, uh, or anybody who's been asking to check before getting inside the school. Mm. For instance, you see uh, here at the background, there's a Veronica bucket place here that everybody has to wash their hands before uh, going. Okay. In, in, Ooh. This, this is a major challenge. Thomas, hold on. Let's, let's cross over to the so Ashanti it, region. Hopefully by then. Bella, uh, from the background, people washing their hands, it's students including parents. Thomas, hold on. Let's cross over to Ibrahim and see if we can get a better feed from him from the Ashanti region. Ibrahim, so you are also in one of the secondary schools. Which one is it and what are you also noticing? So, Bella, I'm currently at the Amadea Senior High School here in Kumasi, and um, what I can tell you is that um, students have started reporting here on campus. We came here early in the morning, and um, everybody was being escorted 
by his or her guardian and most of them came in public transport others afford came in their private vehicles but this is the situation when you get to the entrance of the school before you are even allowed entry no matter who you are you are first in allowed to wash your hands then your temperature is taken then you are being made to sanitize your hands before you are allowed entry into the campus or premises. And it is very Okay. We're getting a bit of feed. Thomas Khan, can you please try and stay silent for us, please? We can hear you in the background. So kindly stay still for us, please. Ibrahim, carry on. So like I was saying, even though government has promised to provide each student and teachers right. with no smart, and every student that I've seen coming here together with the um, guardian or parent is in no smart. In fact, some even have up to two or three because um, for them, even though government will be providing for them, they have to take the safety protocols very seriously. If you, you can even see at the background, some are still waiting. You know, all the day students are supposed to be in boarding and this school they are expecting not less than 2,000 um, students that's comprising the final year students and some students um, form two students for the go track but mm. um, I've been to the dormitories I've been to the various classrooms and um, they've started decongesting the dormitories a dormitory which is traditionally supposed to take 70 will now be handed over to only 40 students. And mm -hmm. the classrooms, too, they've started decongesting it. Um, you know, because today is the first day and people are registering, uh, academic work wouldn't begin. The headmaster told me, and um, possibly by Wednesday, that's when effective academic work will begin. So okay. that is the situation here. Veronica Bakert has been placed um, in front of all the various classrooms and dormitory blocks okay thomas let's see if we can reach you this time around so you can also give us a brief update of what's happening at the infancy film senior high school yeah it's bella so like i already said um here at infancy film school like you can see from the background there's a vernica packet place here at the main entrance so before you get to go inside uh, walk through the gate you are made to wash your hand before you go inside mm. those with uh cars you either go inside and park and then get back to wash your hand, get your temperature checked before you can proceed to wherever you are going. Again, okay. uh, we have some tables there, about four, I see about four or five people sitting behind the table there, where everybody who enters data is taken. For instance, if you are a student, uh, you, you on the form you are, you, you are made to tell them whether you came in with a private uh, vehicle or commercial vehicle all those details are being taken and then again even uh, including the driver who came with you that uh, detail is also taken uh, they tell me that is also done in case uh, any t uh, student is tested positive later they should be able to uh, get to to whoever brought them at least that will is the contact tracing okay. so currently that's what is happening here at infant school all right, thank you so much. Uh, let me cross over to the eastern region and the northern region as well. And Yvonne Nikwe. Yvonne, if you can reposition your phone, I think it's given us uh, a view that, you know, has your head pointing to the side. So kindly just correct that for us. Christopher Mwako is also joining us from the northern region. Good morning. Can you hear us? Christopher. Hello, Christopher. Yvonne, can you also hear me? All right. Hello, Bella. Okay, so Christopher, I have you. You are speaking to us from the northern region. Where exactly are you now and what can you tell us? Okay, we'll be right back. Uh, hopefully, we can connect with Yvonne and Christopher. It's COVID-19 360. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. And we have Christopher Amwako in the northern oh, region. Yeah. He's our correspondent. And he'll give us updates on what's happening with regards to final year senior high uh, school students and also uh, the gold track second year students who are returning to school today. Christopher, if you can hear me, what's the update so far and where are you currently? Yes, so Bella, currently I'm at the Business College International 
in the Tamale Metropolis, a private senior high school in Tamale. Mm. Okay, now tell us, I mean, students are returning today. What are the safety protocols like? Are they in those masks? And if you've been able to go around the school, what have you noticed? Yes, yeah, so before coming to the Business College International, I visited some public um, senior high schools, talk about the Northern uh, School of Business, Nobisco. And as at the time I visited the school, around 8.30 to 9, uh, students were yet to report to school. I cited only four uh, final year students who have reported already to the school. And uh, what the um, teachers have been telling me is that um, all the day students who are supposed to report to school, they just come that they are coming to school. So they are being sent back to go and prepare with their chop boxes, with their uh, items that they'll be needing as boarding students to get to uh, the boarding school. I also entered the school and inspected uh, the dormitories and also the classrooms to know whether or not some measures have been put in place. And the teachers told me that uh, they don't have labor. And once students have just uh, reported, they will have to come and do all the necessary arrangements. But they are strictly going to adhere to the protocols and um, uh, modalities given by the Ghana Education Service and the Ministry of Education. So from there, I moved to the Business College International. And um, right at the entrance, you see inscriptions of no no marks, no entry. And all the students I have cited reporting were in their no marks. And there was there, there is a Veronica bucket right at the entrance. So you wash your hand before you are allowed entry to uh, the school premises. Okay. Now, I also visited the uh, hostel. They have hostel facilities. Previously, it used to be for uh, boarding students who could pay and be in the okay. uh, hostel facilities. But as we speak now, uh, management has opened it to all final year students. In fact, whether you were a border or a All right. student, in accordance, the okay, Christopher, you just have to I'm not paying anything. No so problem. At the business, Christopher, thank the you so much. We'll have to let Yvonne speak. We barely have time. I'm sure that we'll call you in uh, for the subsequent uh, news bulletins as well, so you can give us more updates. Yvonne, you are in the eastern region. Which school okay. precisely are you in, and are they adhering to the protocols? Good morning, Grela. I'm currently at the Yulo Kobo Senior High School, where the school is expecting some 1,201 um, students for both the third year and then the second year gold student. Okay. What is happening here is that the, the COVID protocols are being followed, but unfortunately, a student will have to make do with the classrooms as residential facilities because they do not have enough of that to observe their social protocol. Unfortunately, there are get fun facilities here as well, but those are stored and haven't been completed yet. And so this is what is happening in this school. Okay, now for the day students, are you seeing any of them coming in with their, um, you know, chop box beds and all of that? Are they aware that they will come in as boarders now? Exactly. Some of the day students are coming in with the beds, uh, their buckets and all that. And so they are going through the process, uh, get their details and then uh, the school and then give them uh, where they would have to stay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Yvonne Nikwe and Christopher Amwako uh, from the Eastern and Northern regions, respectively. I also spoke to Thomas Khan and Ibrahim Abubakar from the Central and Ashanti regions, respectively. This is all time will allow. I'm sure that in the subsequent bulletins, you'll hear more of how students are arriving in the various uh, second cycle institutions ready for their final year as well. And so this again has been COVID-19 360. A happy, happy birthday to Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlins one more time. Today's your birthday. We absolutely love you. God bless you. And also to Dr. Dennis Borte. And we'll see you tomorrow. My name is Bella Mundi. I've been doing this with Anita Akia Akufu.